Excellent. So our final talk uh, today is from Johannes Zaya from the uh, Max Planck Institute in Gaar. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot um, to, uh, first of all, the organizers um, for having me here um, to give me the chance to present um, our work at MPQ, which is where I uh, work as a group leader. And thanks, of course, also to everybody who made it until the very end of this long day. Um, and I hope it's going to be an uh, interesting talk for anyone who's here. So what I will talk about um, is basically results that uh, we obtained at the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics um, um, say in the past couple of years um, on microscopy of uh, Rippert systems. And um, this is just one part of the talk. In the second part of the talk, I'd also like to show you some new results from a new experiment, also strontium, that is coming online at the moment. So let me actually start briefly with a uh, motivation of uh, you know, what we are doing and why we're doing that. So basically our motivation is to understand, control, and create many body systems. And of course, in this context, and also in general, it's very interesting to look at many body systems with long range interactions. Why is that so? Well, uh, I just basically picked out two uh, problems or two, uh, say, findings, expectations, and that at the moment um, discuss theoretically what these long range interacting systems actually display. So, long range interactions are interesting because there's always competing length scales. And so, two examples for that are actually um, on the left here, this super solid that you get in an itinerant system where you have on site interaction, also long range interaction and motion. And basically, the interplay between those uh, quantities actually gives rise to a crossover between a continuous system via some uh, system that has uh, that the continuous system being phase coherent, so superfluid, via a system that is then be uh, manipulated at the same time, superfluid, so it's a super solid to a crystal. In a similar way, you can actually look at lattice models here. Um, for example, this uh, 1D model where you have a, a 1D string of atoms that can pop and that have an on site interaction U and a long range, in this case, the long range is nearest neighbor. Uh, interaction to an extended uh, Hubbard model where um, beyond uh, uh, the mod insulator and the superfluid, you actually find new phases, you find a density wave state where you have uh, um, ordered uh, doublons, and you also find this interesting Hadei insulator that's kind of in the middle between the mod insulator and the uh, mod insulator and the density wave. Um, say, uh, which uh, actually shows non-local order, so it's not characterized by new order parameters. So that's a rich playground in non reach systems that we would like to understand. Of course, uh, there are many systems by now that uh, you can use to, to look at these long-range interacting systems in various facets. I cannot go into detail into any of them, but um, on the side, we have, of course, trapped ions that have been doing spin models, spin model simulations for a long time. We have these nice systems of magnetic atoms that we can also uh, used to basically um, see these density, um, say, order states, also with very nice recent work um, using microscopic detection to see these phases. Uh, and of course, the dipolar molecules that are now also progressing very fast within many groups around the world um, and making spectacular uh, breakthroughs along the routes um, of, of uh, understanding the normal interacting system. Of course, what I will uh, talk about in this uh, talk and also in this. Uh, Spirit of this conference is uh, to build a toolbox to look at these long range uh, interacting systems with grid bird atoms. And so um, I already mentioned it here is the outline. I will first show you some results on uh, basically uh, how to use Woodback dressing. I'll explain to you what that is uh, to realize long range interacting systems. Um, and then um, if I have time, I would like to actually show you uh, some new results from a hybrid lattice field that I'm uh, constructing. All right, so let me first introduce you to the uh, experimental setup that we have in Munich, uh, that will be uh, the basis of the first part. So in the Munich, we have what's called a quantum gas microscope, which is a very uh, a nice tool to actually look at dense systems of single atoms. So basically it's a, a microscope that allows you to look at a single plane of atoms, a single two-dimensional plane that we can then basically subject to optical lattices. Um, and that allows us to actually uh, see single sensitive, single atom sensitive detection. It allows us to locally reconstruct the occupation of the, um, the atom distribution in this lattice. And it also allows us to exert single atom control. So it allows us to flip, for example, the spin of individual atoms. And uh, there's basically two images, exemplary images of, of systems that we can realize. They are so called mod insulating states that we realize uh, by going through a common phase transition from the superfluid by increasing the uh, ratio between interactions and uh, tunneling to uh, this mod insulating state. And the mod insulator for us is actually very often a very nice uh, starting state because it's well defined uh, in the sense that you have exactly one atom per lattice size in these uh, systems here. 
And actually, the reason we upgraded um, our optical lattice to a lattice uh, where the spacing is a bit larger, we can still realize this model is later. And you can actually also now make out these individual atoms quite nicely. So Whereas here in the, uh, in the up top image, I can also tell you there are single atoms on the individual lattice side, and you can reconstruct the full density distribution. Um, at least up to the level of, of uh, having zero of one atom, and but we cannot be really nice to make our individual atom. But in reconstruction, we can make. And uh, the next thing, of course, the important thing for this talk is we also need to be able to couple these atoms uh, to with their state in order to realize these long range interactions. And we actually had a recent upgrade here that now allows us to push the Rabi couplings to uh, uh, values beyond uh, um, 20 megahertz, actually, which is, um, I, I would say, close to the state of. Um, these quantum gas microscopes are very special, uh, also compared with uh, tweezer setups, because in these uh, systems, um, you don't only have, uh, you know, isolated atoms that don't talk to one another, um, but you can actually uh, explore tunneling. So you can realize the Hubbard model where you have this on-site interaction and the hopping, and you can really control the relative scale between the two. And this, of course, uh, opens up a new, you know, direction of quantum simulation that you can do. For example, you can look at the superfluid mod insulator transition that I already mentioned. And now the question is, of course, how can you actually connect this Hubbard physics with the Rydberg um, physics? And uh, that's actually one, let's say, fundamental problem here, which is that uh, if you look at the energy scales of these Hubbard parameters, the tunneling and interaction, they're actually much smaller than the energy scales associated with the Rydberg uh, atoms that you have. Right inside that can, of course, be up to gigahertz if you look at the track, or if you look at the incoherence mechanism of Rydberg decay um, in the kilohertz range. And so the question is basically, how can we connect the, let's say, the right hand side here, where we've already seen nice examples of, of how you can explore it back easing physics and quantum simulators based on uh, um, uh, optical tweezers uh, with this Hubbard physics side here on the left hand side. And um, of course, this is interesting because this is exactly where this interplay happens that I mentioned in the intro between, you know, tunneling dynamics, continuous systems, and then this long range interaction that kind of breaks this. Uh, uh, you know, continuous um, symmetry and need to order and it's interesting super solid phase, for example. And uh, the answer to this has actually been discussed uh, already, I think, more than 20 years ago by now, and it's what we call Rydberg graphing. So it's basically the idea that um, rather than resonantly coupling to Rydberg state, you do, uh, um, you know, an off-resonant coupling, so you create a dread state, um, and as you know from the uh, usual uh, two-level systems, this dread state means that you have uh, a control over how much uh, you know, Brown's refraction in this case and how much Rydberg fraction you put into the stress state by controlling the tuning and the Rabi frequency. And the idea now is to play with this um, admixture here to basically get enough Rydberg Rydberg interaction to see interesting physics and to tune them, um, while at the same time not getting too much of the you know decoherence mechanism due to Rydberg light. And so this is kind of the, the, uh, the trade-off that we always have to face. I will come to how, uh, what that means actually. Um, and um, so um, the, the point is, okay, this, this can be done. And actually you can work out that if you uh, uh, dress um, an atom, a transit atom off presently to a Rydberg state, and you now, now look at two atoms and you change the distance, you actually get an interaction potential that looks like this. You get this soft shoulder, soft core potential that uh, long range looks like uh, one over R to the six, basically it's uh, um, the thunderbolts that you have, but then it saturates at short distances. And these values can be now uh, tuned via omega and uh, the detuning in the following way. So you basically get a, a saturation value, this uh, V0 here, that uh, scales as omega to the fourth divided by the tuning cubed. Um, it's uh, um, important to stress again, it's light induced, so it can be controlled by light, turned on and off at will. And it's a potential between uh, interaction between ground state atoms or mostly ground state atoms if you make the, the in an admixture small. It's extended range in the sense of that uh, this uh, shoulder here can be on the micron scale, as shown here. And, and this is uh, what I already said, this is kind of the motivation. You now have an increased uh, um, uh, effective lifetime that is just scaled essentially by the inverse of mixture. So if you mix 1% of Rydberg uh, probability, then your lifetime will be uh, in theory by a factor of 100. And this, of course, allows you now to kind of bridge this gap to uh, reach uh, the Hubbard regime. So before I actually discussing um, our recent efforts on, on reaching the Hubbard regime, let me actually go take one step back and show you how one can actually show, uh, demonstrate uh, in principle that these stress interactions actually appear, exist in, in the setup or in the, in the systems. And so what we do there is actually we make use of the smart insulator and we actually in this case pin the atoms 
And we uh, use two internal states uh, of rubidium in the ground state um, to do a Ramsey interferometry sequence. So basically, we start with all the atoms in the specific spin state of rubidium. Then we uh, open an interferometer with a microwave power two pulse. Um, we have a, an echo pulse with a pi and another pi over two pulse. And in between, we turn on the stressing light. And what the stressing light now does is it uh, gives rise to this interaction. And in this Ramsey, you can actually show that the interaction translates to a, a correlated phase shift. And we can actually read out this phase shift in the end by imaging um, the, uh, the spin components so by basically measuring the direction which the spin spins point. And uh, this uh, interaction actually just shows up as a correlation in this final image. And so here is actually what we see. This is a, a, a measurement we did a couple of years back. So you start with uh, you know, no UV, and then you increase the time during which you apply the stressing pulse, and you can actually see that these correlations build up, and you see, in principle, this soft core mirror. And um, now, uh, what I said actually is, is um, that this soft core, in this case, comes due to the one of R to the six. So it's kind of a, a ghost, if you want, of the block case. This raises the question whether you can actually do something, uh, you know, more more interesting if you make use of the fact that Rydberg states don't only have one over R to the six uh, interactions, but for example, you can have these uh, this minima here in the Rydberg interaction potential. So this is something that um, we looked at a couple of years back. That um, you know, because of some avoided crossings that you see here, you actually get also like binding potentials, and it's not just a standard one over R to the six. And the question is actually what happens to these stress potentials if you have these, let's say, exotic binding potentials or just cusp uh, linear potential. And the answer is, if you do this off resonant and mixed strip trick, you actually get interaction control. So you can, on the one side, uh, as I said, get this one over R to the six, uh, um, um, you know, the, the soft core potential that's related with one over R to the six. But if you then, for example, couple to such a, such a dip here, to such a binding potential, you can actually also realize these strongly peaked potentials. And this is something that's quite exotic. And of course, a nice control knob that we have using this you know, light induced uh, potential in this case. And now, of course, this is uh, theory so far. Can we also see that? Um, the answer is yes, we can. We can just measure it in the exactly same way as we measure the soft core, just coupling now specifically to this, uh, to this uh, potential minimum. And um, you can see here, maybe uh, best uh, looking again at the correlation plots, that now the correlation is really localized, actually in this case, across the diagonal of our lattice, just because this potential minimum is actually located exactly at the point where you uh, have, you know, see, see the distance between two atoms across the diagonal. Then you can also scan this um, as a function of time, and you see this diagonal correlation actually builds up, and, you know, in theory, it would actually build up, go down, go up, and then oscillate uh, fashion. So this shows that we can actually uh, control this uh, this uh, potential not only in strength but also in shape. And actually, it's also nice to see what we get in terms of the images because uh, here, if you now look at a single shot, uh, you know because of the fact that you uh, uh, imprint this pairwise phase shift, and uh, you also get basically just pairs popping up, pop popping up in these images. And actually, they're paired uh, that that you see always aligned with the diagonal because that's again how the phase shift occurs. And you can translate the phase shift into the spin signal. So that's uh, uh, nice and good. Uh, now the question is, uh, what about motion time scales? And that's actually a big problem. And this big problem is uh, what I would call the maybe lifetime problem of the dressing. Um, I just basically uh, pulled out an old lifetime measurement that we did uh, in combination with this uh, with this extended range uh, dressing. But it doesn't really matter because most of the measurements we take look similar. Um, and the problem is the lifetime as well. So on the uh, the x axis here, what we see is lifetimes in microseconds. And I was just telling to you, or trying to tell you, that actually, in order to do these Keenan uh, um, physics um, and systems, you actually need to go to milliseconds or even like hundreds of milliseconds. And this is a big problem. And uh, we and also other people um, now have uh, an understanding of these short lifetimes, they're actually orders of magnitude shorter than expected, because we, um, we think that this is due to a collectively enhanced uh, effective decay um, that scales with uh, you know the number of atoms, so the, the, the decoherence uh, scales with the number of atoms due to nearby interacting states. So the idea is that uh, when you dress these uh, Rydberg states, even if you only have a small probability to actually find an atom in the Rydberg state, there can be black body decay into neighboring states, and these events can then actually massively uh, you know uh, lead to avalanche effects, and you can actually destroy the whole system. And the reason why that is actually a problem in dressing and not so much on in resonance systems. 
is that uh, in dressing, you're kind of living from this, uh, um, you know, lifetime, uh, uh, lifetime increase. Yeah? So you kind of, uh, and whereas um, the, 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 you know, the radio frequency and everything is still very fast time scale. So if you have this, this uh, catastrophic failure, then you actually have very high radio coupling that potentially acts resonantly, whereas what you think you do is to be far off resonant and, and you know, um, expect long lifetime. So this is kind of, the reason this high Rabi coupling that we need is actually the problem. So what do we do? Actually, there are two things you can do. One is uh, just something we figured out some time ago already, where you can just reduce the number of atoms and you can actually also reduce the dimensionality or dimensionality basically going to 1D because this uh, uh, suppresses this avalanche. And this actually helps a lot. Um, and which, which we saw, so you essentially get within a factor of two of the textbook lifetime. But there's more you can do, uh, and uh, the more in this case is actually that you can use uh, what we call stroboscopic dressing. And the idea here is that uh, rather than just continuously turning on your dressing light, um, you basically pulse the dressing light, um, and you pulse it in a way that the average potential that you have is the same as that the one you would get in continuous dressing. But the way you do that is you just basically pulse on a much stronger dressing potential for a short time, again, such that the average uh, goes is, is, uh, amounts to the same value as in the continuous case. And why does this help? Actually, this you can work out very easily. You can work it out by comparing the interaction strength in the stress uh, potential with the effective lifetime that you get that uh, scales up with the inverse uh, um, mixture. And you take the product, this is like the quality factor, so good to bad ratio of product in this case, and you see that actually this is best uh, when you're on resonance. So uh, when you are basically, um, you know, uh, working uh, with a unity at, at a mixture, if you want, so if you do a res do a, doing resonance physics. And so from that, uh, you learn that what you want to do is you actually want to work with as far from a mixture as you can. And of course, that means uh, you get higher, um, um, you know, effective stress interaction. And so if you smear that higher stress interaction out over time, because you're working at a uh, larger mixture, you actually gain, uh, you have a net gain. And the question is now, is this uh, only a theory or does this work in practice also in the experiment? And the answer is yes, it works. And it actually works quite well. So here you see a direct comparison between two cases where we have a continuous uh, um, you know, dressing uh, pulse that gives us a lifetime of something like 40 milliseconds. Expected in this case would be the 80 milliseconds. So we, have, uh, we are within a factor of two of the theory value. But then when you, when you go to a, a, um, a stroboscopic sequence, you can actually boost this uh, uh, lifetime by a factor of, um, in this case, uh, a lot of eight or so, um, uh, just essentially by uh, going closer to resonance while keeping the same um, average interaction potential in this, um, let's say, um, stroboscopic sense, in this average sense. And uh, now you can actually compare the soft core height with this lifetime, and that's actually uh, you know a number that is not so bad. We get uh, you know to to something like twenty effective uh, uh, inverse. So the quality factor in this case is twenty or so. And we can actually also work out how this uh, should scale. So this was now for a specific fixed uh, duty cycle, so the ratio between on and off time. And we can actually show that if we vary the duty cycle, um, this uh, effective lifetime increase scales with uh, one of the over the third root. Of the duty cycle, the inverse duty cycle, and so you know, in principle, if you make your duty cycle longer and longer, um, this should be more larger and larger. Uh, actually, sorry, smaller and smaller. So you basically go closer to resonance and uh, have longer dark time. This should get better. Of course, there are limits at some point, so we didn't push it too far. But we can nicely see this. Thing. All right. So this is now actually promising because now, if you look at the lifetime, they are actually in the hundred milliseconds range, and this is very well compatible with Hubbard physics. And so now, of course, we want to make use of this, and uh, we want to make do an experiment where we, uh, uh, you know, bring these two ingredients together: the Rydberg dress interactions, and then the tunneling we have in the lattice. And so the experiment that we that we wanted to do um, was basically, and this is kind of a preliminary measurement um, that that we uh, did here, um, it's kind of uh, you know trying to see what effect of the soft core uh, repulsion in this case is. Uh, upon uh, um, when you do a quantum quench and you allow the particles to tunnel. And what you can easily convince yourself of is that if you start with this charge density wave, with this checkerboard, um, checkerboard is maybe the right way to say it, state, uh, and you have this extended range interaction, this stabilizes this initial state if you now allow the particles to tunnel. Because if a tunnel a particle would tunnel, then it would feel the interaction of the, the nearest neighbor. And of course, uh, this is something that the system wants to avoid. 
And so what we do now is we do two measurements. Uh, we um, basically do a measurement with and without the pressing. We quench the system uh, from this initial state, um, uh, allowing the atoms to tunnel. And then you just look over time whether this uh, state basically is preserved or not. And here the, the data is just, again very preliminary. As a function of uh, evolution time, we see that if we don't have good pressing, um, basically, this initial up, down, up, down, up, down pattern, this is now uh, represented as a density density correlation that just measures basically whether it's a structure, uh, it basically quickly decays. Whereas if we turn on the dressing, you see the stabilizing effect in the beginning and even after up to five hopping times, you still have some of this uh, uh, trace of this uh, uh, you know, uh, initial pattern. And uh, what I should point out is that, that this is actually a, a closely related with work that was done in lithium by the group of Azim Barker. Um, some kind of goal. And uh, in lithium, actually, the scalings um, are a bit more favorable because lithium is light and time scales are fast. You don't have to bridge that much um, of, of, you know, of difference in the tunneling uh, versus good back uh, time scales. And so what we can do here with the stroboscopic dressing is actually to show that also in lithium, this is feasible to, to reach this adherence um, regime. The next step on this will actually be that uh, we don't just do a quench experiment, but we also try to prepare adiabatically, let's say, uh, for example, a charge density wave. So that's kind of what we are working on right now. This requires a bit of control over basically preparing low field superfluids, which we've uh, worked on in the, in the recent past. And so we are actually uh, right now uh, trying to get some first signals for adiabatically preparing, let's say, for example, a charge density wave, um, starting from a, a superfluid and such a condimentary system. All right, um, so with this, um, I, I will close the first part um, and uh, now transition to this uh, new experiment that we are setting up. And uh, this experiment in, in many ways is actually mod like motivated uh, um, by you know, the measurements we could, we could already do in this rubidium machine. And the uh, um, idea is, of course, to go beyond what we did there and improve the hardware. Um, and um, one of the main problems of this rubidium machine is actually that the preparation time is extremely long. So every time we take a, a, a shot, it takes about 25 to 30 seconds to get a data point. And so now something that we've learned in the recent past is looking at these freezer experiments. If you have cycle times in the seconds or say 100 milliseconds range, um, this is actually a tremendous uh, advantage because you can, for example, uh, characterize things much more accurately. So um, Emmanuel was showing yesterday this um, idea of uh, reconstructing Hamiltonian parameters um, from you know, large data sets. This is something that would be nice to try, of course, in the quantum gas microscope, but it's very difficult because it's hard to get the, the data, the number of data, amount of data to do such things. And so what would be very nice is actually to have a quantum gas microscope that kind of shares some of the features of such a tweezer setup in that sense. And um, so uh, this is one motivation. It's one of many motivations uh, that we started uh, the few experiment about uh, two and a half years ago. Um, other motivations uh, actually uh, came to us in the last few years where some of these uh, results came out. So um, basically um, in the group of um, um, Adam Kaufman and Ted Stiller, um, they now showed that actually combining optical lattice with a tweezer, you can basically in a controlled way place atoms in the lattice and then look at highly coherent tunneling dynamics. And uh, so this is really a new way to prepare these systems in the Hubbard regime, just using laser cooling. Um, also uh, in the group of uh, Vadim Barker, they followed a slightly different approach, but they were able to do some first many body uh, physics by basically loading um, and detecting um, atoms from a lattice into a tweezer array, and then just uh, basically making use of the variable geometries you can realize with the tweezer array to look at these interesting from Hubbard systems. And then something that we recently did um, on the rubidium uh, with a slow cycle time, but still I think it shows nicely the potential that we have if we combine these two platforms is that we were actually able to realize new emergent lattices like here you see a deep lattice, uh, just basically by using the tweezers if you want to block out specific sites in the optical lattice. So I think there are you know, um, in various facets in which a combination of these two systems uh, could be quite fruitful. And so um, for uh, a couple of reasons, we decided to go with strontium-88. Um, and so here's our, um, our experimental setup. So what we have is we have, um, I guess, like a, a standard uh, tweezer setup with a high NA objective, a glass cell that allows us basically um, you know, to realize a tweezer array. And in addition, we also have this optical lattice. And uh, just a few words about, uh, about the system. So at the moment, we are um, you know, creating tweezer arrays routinely at a wavelength of 520 nanometers. The optical lattice is at twice that wavelength uh, because we have the laser. Um, we have uh, residual inhomogeneities of about 2%. We, can, we think we can improve that significantly. Um, we were just not, uh, say, we were too lazy to, to push it. But I mean, we see that we can nicely um, uh, decrease the homogeneity, uh, increase the homogeneity, so decrease the inhomogeneity. 
And what you can also do is you can make use of the nice property of strontium that you can laser cool it very well in the tweezer. And so here you see a typical uh, sideband spectrum of strontium that we obtained by first going into a magic field configuration that was uh, worked out, for example, by, uh, um, by um, Adam Kaufmann's group and also by Manuel's group. And then we can just do sideband cooling to get to very low uh, emotional um, excitation numbers. Um, the way we image in strontium um, is actually in these green tweezers uh, the, the following way. So we basically um, start with the atoms uh, as usual in the ground state, and we have this broad imaging transition that's uh, in the blue um, at 461 nanometers. And uh, to get an image, actually, we can scatter um, on this broad transition while at the same time cooling on the narrow transition. And now there's actually a problem uh, which other people have seen which is related with these 520-ish uh, uh, nanometer tweezers. And the problem is that if we uh, try to image in these tweezers, we see quite significant loss. So we have uh, survival rates of something like 95 or 90 to 97 um, percent. And this is actually very much compatible with what other people have seen. And um, uh, this is, of course, a problem if you think about, for example, scaling these systems, and especially if you want to do resorting also, because the resorting in the end will be limited by how well you can detect and then use that information to resort. And so um, this uh, general question is actually, I would say, unsolved. Uh, there are some candidates uh, that, that could be made responsible for this uh, loss. One candidate is a 1D2 state that is uh, here in the middle, to which the 1P1 state can actually decay into the, into the triplet manifold here, and which uh, in the green actually you know, is this kind of popping to higher uh, levels that could cause this to be anti trap but also that could be from resonance. And we think that this could be uh, part of the story. But uh, instead of actually uh, going after this, which other people have tried and, and uh, I think uh, failed, and I mean, we haven't fully given up, but for the time being, we, we said, okay, let's not try this further. And uh, we thought, okay, um, why don't we just use our lattice that we anyways have planned in the experiment um, to actually pin the atoms in the tweezers and just perform the imaging in the lattice. And this actually has the additional advantage that you can basically just essentially use any tweezer wavelength you want. You are basically not limited to green where you can do nice magic uh, fields or, or 813 where you do clock magic stuff, but you can really do anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is, uh, was basically the motivation for us to try and image the tweezers in the lattice. Now, before I go to the results there, I want to briefly give you a, a, an update on, on how uh, cooling, laser cooling in strontium works. Um, this is what I think briefly alluded to by Manuel yesterday, so I want to go a bit more in detail. So basically, strontium is very special, uh, and I would say maybe all the alkaline earth atoms or alkaline earth light atoms are special in the sense that they have these narrow line cooling transitions. So this, of course, on the one side, if you go to magic traps, allows you to do direct sideband cooling, uh, which you can use for imaging, but it also allows you to actually uh, cool an image in a new way by making use of differential trap depths uh, in combination with this narrow line. The idea here is basically that uh, uh, this narrow line transition here allows you to spatially resolve specific regions in the trap. And you can now actually uh, come up with two, and, and this actually allows you to realize Sisyphus-like cooling uh, um, schemes. And there are basically two regimes. Um, there's uh, what uh, is now called a repulsive Sisyphus uh, regime and an attractive Sisyphus regime, which basically is related uh, with uh, the relative polarizability of the excited state to the ground state. So if the ground state is more deeply trapped than the excited state, you're in the repulsive Sisyphus cooling regime. And uh, if, you're, if the opposite is true, you're in the attractive Sisyphus regime. And so here is actually shown how this works for the repulsive Sisyphus regime. Basically, you put your uh, laser at a certain uh, position in, in frequency because of the differential trap, you can essentially resolve space. And then you can convince yourself that this here is a closed uh, circle. So you, you can basically always excite an atom here, would be excited, go down, uh, um, decay when it's at the, the center. And this uh, essentially leads to a net decrease in energy. And now, uh, people who actually thought of this pooling uh, were uh, these uh, you know, uh, well known people here. And they actually wrote uh, in this paper where they described this cooling mechanism for the first time that actually in this attractive Sisyphus uh, cooling regime, um, they see no problem. They see this as a, a viable cooling technique. But uh, they also say that uh, cooling is not possible actually if you are in the repulsive Sisyphus regime, because uh, then basically uh, uh, there will always be a, a loss process that you cannot overcome. And so now a question that arises immediately is if you're in the repulsive Sisyphus regime, can you actually do imaging? And uh, actually the answer to that question are, are cooling uh, and cool enough to do imaging. 
And the answer to that uh, was actually given already in the paper by uh, Manuel's group in 2018. The answer is yes, but there is, was still some loss observed. So the next higher order question you could ask is, can you do high fidelity and low loss imaging? So is this a uh, process where they said this is detrimental? Um, is this actually fundamentally you know, limiting your survival and your imaging fidelity? And uh, why is this actually relevant for us? Well, it's actually quite relevant because at 1040, which is our lattice wavelength that we want to use to pin the atoms, we are in this repository for spooling machine. So this whole idea of using the lattice would not work if this uh, was true, what we say. And so, okay, uh, we said, let's try it out. Uh, let's actually measure uh, uh, in the following way how well this imaging work. We basically first prepare our strontium atoms in the tweezer, we perform cooling, and then we take three images. For the time being, we only need uh, two of those. Um, and uh, this is what the images look like, so image one, two, and three. And now, of course, you can play a game and, and start looking where you see losses. And I can tell you there are actually some, but very few. So this was actually already quite good to see this, because if you would do this, were to do the same thing with the tweezers directly in the 520 uh, tweezers, you would actually see obvious loss. So in the lattice, it seems to be much better already. And so now uh, we can also quantify how much better better is by just comparing essentially the uh, loss you have in image two condition on whether you have an atom in image one. And uh, this is what uh, is shown here. So as a function, in this case of exposure time, we just vary, um, we, we just look at uh, the loss probability. And this is, I should say, actually not only varying exposure time, it's actually keeping the photon flux fixed so that the fidelity, discrimination fidelity of your imaging is, is also fixed. And uh, what we can see actually is that uh, this loss probability can go down to uh, low 10 to the minus three values. So you can actually get up to 99.7% uh, survival rate, which is, uh, uh, of course, uh, a big uh, step um, compared to what you get in the tweezers. And uh, so the first takeaway here is that low loss imaging is actually possible even under these repository Sisyphus um, um, conditions. Next question is, uh, uh, can you also do high fidelity imaging? And uh, the answer to that is given by the histogram. So here's our histogram, typical histogram. And you can basically see that it's very uh, well uh, um, possible to resolve the zero atom peak from the one atom peak, which allows you to, with high probability, high fidelity, say whether on a given side you have an atom. So uh, it's not only a low loss image, it's also a high fidelity image. And this is something that um, I would say is, uh, wasn't clear and also wasn't known um, beforehand that in this repository it was a uh, uh, regime, you could get both of those together. All right, and now you can ask, is there any, uh, anything else you would like to do? And of course uh, there is, because of course uh, at the moment we just uh, took three images in the lattice. If you wanna uh, do something interesting, maybe use the tweezers for um, blocks or um, maybe use the green tweezers to trap the Rittbergs. Of course you ask, have to ask, can you actually go back from the lattice to the tweezers? And so this is, and, and then uh, go back for imaging. So basically you only use the lattice for, for imaging. And uh, the answer to that is also yes. So what is shown here is basically the loss probability. Um, and you can see uh, in the best case, this is down to like 1.3%. And what you also see is that it actually strongly depends on the relative orientation of the, or relative positioning of the lattice and the tweezer. So what we do here is we actually intentionally vary the relative position between the tweezer and the lattice. And you see how the loss actually uh, you know, is modulated and the modulation is exactly the, given by the lattice facing these. All right, so now we have the transfer back. Uh, it's 1.3%. We actually think we can do much better. So at times we see less than 1% uh, uh, losses, um, but we think that this is a bit limited by some environmental instabilities. So this uh, um, actually looks quite promising. Now, one final question is, uh, uh, what's the state of the atom in terms of temperature? So do they heat? Uh, and the answer is yes, they heat considerably. So if we do a temperature measurement after the transfer back into the tweezer, and you remember now the nice, uh, you know, um, Two peak uh, signal that we had uh, in the tweezer before the transfer. This is like a much hotter signal. So you clearly see the emergence of this red sideband, which indicates the atoms are hot. But the good news is uh, we can also use laser cooling again because we are back in the tweezers. And so if we apply laser cooling, we can actually essentially get the atoms almost perfectly back into the ground state within the measurement error. This is uh, comparable to what we have before this whole transfer. So we can actually uh, reinitialize the atoms again as uh, in pretty much the same state as before the transfer and everything before the imaging. And so of course, it's something that we're very excited about. We think that we can still push this a, a lot further and also comes with quite some advantages of using the tweezers again, because you mainly because you have the tweezers uh, now completely you know, uh, free. You, you, you can choose any tweezer you want and just use this pinning potential to do the imaging. Of course, it's a bit of a, an issue also because uh, uh, one thing that um, eventually you want to do is you actually want to, let's say, get rid of this auxiliary tweezer potential. So why can you not do everything in the lattice? 
and uh, to uh, and, and basically just use the tweezers, for example, for resorting. And uh, to to show you that that this is actually maybe an interesting um, uh, direction, I I just basically post here an image of of the lattice that we use for pinning. And rather than going to the tweezers and loading the lattice, now we just load the lattice directly. And you can actually see now uh, here a region with about fifteen thousand atoms, about thirty thousand sites. And you can basically still, uh, even though this is such a large region, uh, nicely make out individual atoms. And of course, the vision for this would be that rather than using the tweezers as auxiliary potentials to load, we directly load into lattice, and then we exert control using the tweezers to sort the atoms and to kind of build these uh, um, puppet systems uh, ground up. And so this is actually something that we are very excited about. All right, so uh, I'm almost done. Uh, very briefly, I um, we also have uh, more projects in Munich. Um, if you're interested in either cavities and how to couple them to Rippberg arrays or also uh, strontium-based quantum computing, um, I'd be happy to talk about this because these are two uh, projects that are ongoing. And uh, with this, I would actually like to finish um, and especially thank the teams. So most of the dressing results were from the single atoms team here on the left, pushed by Pascal, the postdoc. And uh, this is the Strontium Woodback team. They pushed this new platform out of the ground in the last two and a half years. And we are really excited um, uh, in finally getting this going. And so with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. <laughs> Thanks, Johannes. So, any questions? Yes. Thank you, Johannes. Mm -hmm. If you want to the whole the Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what do you think would be the realistic perspective? Yeah. This is, uh... Uh, I think it's very difficult. I mean, I think uh, so. We, we know ripper crossing is on the edge, right? You're always compromising. Um, and uh, the super solid is particularly difficult, especially this uh, this one instance I showed, uh, because you need to actually cram a lot of particles within the 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 soft core, and uh, in these very dense systems, the losses actually also go up. The variants of the super solids that you also know very well, I think, uh, where you're in the lattice and you're in dilute, more dilute systems. Uh, I think there maybe it's a bit more hopeful, but it's clear that this will always be sort of transient. Uh, phenomenon because you are ultimately always limited by the good back decay. And I mean, I think there's not so much you can do. You can do this in cryo, which of course will improve things. Um, and so then in the end becomes a question of, of what's the window that you can reach. And I mean, I think there, I mean, I think one can probably see this, but you know, it's not like a long term large system size. Thank you. I have a person that is interested in school mm -hmm. and I, I read these old papers, but mm -hmm. I you did it in the regime where they said it was Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, okay. Uh, I think this is basically uh, uh, the question is uh, what do you say? Um, what do you mean when you say it doesn't work? I think that you have to discriminate between it doesn't work in theory and it doesn't work in practice. And I would say uh, it doesn't work in theory because at some point you will always have events that. You know, the, the problem with this, maybe I should uh, take one step back, is that in principle, this repository was cooling is in unstable because uh, whenever you have an atom that makes it beyond the cap, this is sure to be lost. Yeah, but if you you kind of make sure that never it never actually makes it there, then in practice it is possible to keep this going. But eventually, of course, there will always be a fluctuation that pushes you beyond, and so in practice uh, and in theory, I think this always you know will will lead to, to a loss of the full system. In that sense, it's kind of... No, it's a lot. We think we understand. It's actually not a lot. It's a misspecification because we have a little bit of popping in the lattice every now and then. And so we actually just uh, working on, on that. Um, and I think then it's, it's essentially the, the limit is just vacuum uh, lifetime. So the, I didn't say that, but there was the dash line that kind of the loss asymptotes to. This is our our two hundred eighty seconds vacuum lifetime. So, so that's where we that that's what the ten to the minus speed then gives, or is where you where you're sensitive. I think one of the The question in the back there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, yes, I mean, you played with this. I, I think we have quite some headroom on the histogram here. Uh, so I think one can actually uh, decrease the, the, um, I mean, the quota quite a bit. And um, we think actually you're asking, I think, about this, uh, about this side here. We think that we're actually at the moment cooling power limited. So in principle, the, the cooling power should, should improve this. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But we, yeah, yeah, yeah. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't fully explored that yet. I think this is. Uh, is it? What, what was this? I mean, here yeah, like one. This is that one. I, I mean, we typically go here to the minimum two hundred and fifty. Oh. But we can, I think. In, We have, I mean, it's uh, actually just everything uh, the, the region of interest. So I think one can also do a better job in reconstruction and then push this. Yes. Uh, yes, we tried. I mean, this is actually also a paper that came out uh, at least on the archive by uh, the Stuttgart people. Um, yeah, we tried this for a bit. Um, I mean, it kind of works, but there you actually, I mean, there it's a bit more lossy. So this we see that uh, if we cool in this repository Sisyphus uh, regime and we want to get very cold, uh, it starts to become uh, an issue. Uh, then then we get lossy. So there, in that sense, imaging is, is a different thing. as yeah. And I mean, we can get close to the ground state. I don't know how close, but uh, uh, we see that the loss is cold. I just ask one question about mm -hmm. the sideband spectroscopy. You, you, this, um, you see the shift, you know, at a higher temperature, the blue sideband mm -hmm. shifts and changes shape. Does that mean you're both not magic and it's unharmonic in the trap or that you access the uh, anomalous uh, You're referring to the data after transfer? Uh, yeah, that one. Uh, uh, yeah. So yeah, okay. it's yeah. the peak shift. Yeah, and yes. It's yes. broadened. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It's actually not a lot. I think basically, um, if you do the fit, uh, I think it's just, uh, I don't know, maybe three or four kilohertz shifted because it sits on the shoulder. Um, but yes, I mean, this predicts, uh, I think actually the, 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 um, the shift would go in the opposite direction. So I, I, I the blue shift, I, I actually, at the moment, I don't know. I, okay. I would have to think mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. Um, so if it's anharmonicity, I think it should go. The other way. The other way. Yeah. So um yeah. I would have to have to think about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The diagram before they get the camera focus. Ah yeah, okay. This is uh sorry for being sloppy here. Uh, it's a conversion basically. So the camera has a uh, has an offset essentially. So any camera you have always gives you a positive offset, uh, uh the way it works, because that's how the, the readout registers is essentially configured, uh, or the amplifier. And so what we do is we typically subtract the offset and uh, because it is a positive offset, it can have fluctuations. And so it would be probably correct if it cut the here, but mm -hmm. so it's just a sloppy. Uh, I think the axis we couldn't call, call it photons. And it's a count uh, in this case, but it corresponds uh, to photons essentially. And so the, the scaling is correct with the offset. Okay, good. So let's thank Johannes again. Thank all the speakers today.